Hello everyone and welcome to this lunch hour lecture. As part of UCL's work during Mental Health Awareness Week, we'll be hearing from Professor Anthony David, Director at the Institute of Mental Health at University College London. Prior to being appointed Director at UCL, Anthony was Vice Chair at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Today, Tony will be speaking to us about the links between mental health and pandemics. He'll be looking specifically at suicide and will be summarising work from a recent systematic review which highlights anxiety, depression and stress disorders following coronavirus infections. Tony will also show how modern research and social media are helping us monitor mental health in the population. We'll be taking questions via Slido and information on how to join the Slido are in the email you received with the information about today's lecture. So do get in touch with your questions and also vote on the questions that you'd most like to hear answered. I hope you enjoy the lecture today and now over to Tony. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Daisy, for the introduction and thanks everyone uh, for joining us today at the UCL Lunchtime Lecture. Um, it's a great opportunity to talk to you. And of course, the one subject on everyone's mind is the pandemic. So I'm going to talk about previous pandemics and the current one. Okay, so these are our genuine electron micrographs of the SARS uh, coronavirus 2. Uh, they're obviously colored in a little bit because they're smaller than the wavelength of visible light. This, on the other hand, are some graphics, but it gives you my title, Mental Health and Pandemics, Past, Present and Future. I hope you can see this picture. It's uh, from uh, 1918, uh, soldiers in force with Spanish flu. Uh, you may have heard why we call this 1918 Spanish flu. It was, of course, still in the midst of what, and there were news blackies, except Spain, which was neutral. So they reported on this new pandemic that was striking its, the country, and it became known as Spanish flu. But in fact, it's quite possible that the pandemic began in the USA. A lot of chicken farmers in Kansas, and perhaps the virus jumped from chickens to man, and there was certainly a big uh, outbreak at the army base there. And it's thought that perhaps airmen that went over from Kansas and uh, World War I carried the virus with them. Of course, there are also other stories. And in fact, one lesson from pandemics is that uh, the name of the pandemic and how it started is fortly contested, and it's only historians many years later that can tell us the truth. But here are some images from that pandemic. The same questions about whether we should wear face masks and uh, reduce contagion by staying at home. Um, and this was one of the public health messages of the time. Obey the laws and wear the gauze, protect your jaws from septic pores. As brief as stay alert, but I quite like that as a public health message. And these are some examples of the sort of mortality graphs that were shared at the time. Uh, the one in the middle is from England and Wales, and it shows actually how that there was a small peak followed by a much larger one and then a larger one. So there was certainly more than one wave to the Spanish flu pandemic. And the other graph shows a sort of international league table with the USA at the top in terms of mortality, followed by, well, New York, I should say, followed by London and other European cities. So some things haven't changed, but maybe we've seen enough of these sorts of graphs. How people responded to, at the time is interesting. Some artists were to succumb. Uh, this is Edvard Munch, Norwegian artist, and he did some self-portraits, the world self-portrait, Spanish flu, and the one on the right is self-portrait, after Spanish flu. I'm not sure he looks very much better. Uh, and indeed, he remained a strange and reclusive man until he died 
1944 syphilis. So what about mental health in the aftermath of the Spanish flu pandemic? Well, we don't really know very much. There was a possible increase in cases of psychosis, the most, most severe kind of mental illness. Uh, and the and Carl Menninger wrote about this in the US. What about suicide? Well, in times of war, suicide rates are tenses from uh, the time of Durkheim in the 19th century who studied this, and he wondered whether increase in social cohesion around times of crisis can actually ward off suicide. So here's what happened to mortality uh, in England and Wales uh, looking over the last century and a half. And you can see that the suicide rate really plummets during World War I. And it climbs up again, we, but of course that obscures the fact that the end of the war, uh, we were going through a pandemic. It's estimated that 40 million people died in World War I, and perhaps 50 million people died of the Spanish flu pandemic. So it's very hard to tease out the effects of these global events on suicide rates, even in England. But you can see that the peak of suicide rates in our country was at the Great Depression. And this reflects the very important lesson that economic factors play a big role. Then again, there was a fall in suicide rates in World War II and not so much a rebound as we saw after World War I, possibly because there wasn't a pandemic. And in fact, suicide rates have more or less been gradually falling since the end of World War II. What about other pandemics? Well, suicide rates after the SARS pandemic in 2000 and showed a small peak, uh, certainly in Hong Kong among older people. Um, there are some local factors that might have accounted for this. You can see that in the graph there in the gray, this peak um, coincides with the peak in mortality for, from the um, pneumonia itself. It remains to be seen whether we see something like that in our own country. So thinking about mental health in relation to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we should think about the direct effects of the, the virus brain. And we're learning this. Uh, it's very complicated. If I'm not going to talk about those today, uh, but we should bear them in mind. Then, of course, there's the effects of the illness itself, of bereavement, of our fear of the illness, and then the effects of our attempts to deal with it, the social isolation and financial hardship that follows the lockdown, and possibly some unexpected positive effects. So the research community, uh, including our own, has been very active to try and understand uh, what we should do about this uh, crisis and advise people and the research community on where they should be directing their efforts. So mental health has been seen as very important early on. And it is, of course, the Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, some would say, well, we have enough awareness. We've got to go beyond awareness to action. So some of these publications are very instructive. The first from colleagues at King's College London about the effects of quarantine. The shorter, the better, the more adverse effects with longer quarantine. And we've got to believe in what we're doing for it to be uh, positive. Then there was another publication in the Lancet Psychiatry led by Emily Holmes from Oxford with others from around the country saying that we should concentrate on anxiety and depression and see whether that has changed after COVID as well as the mental health consequences of lockdown. Those should be our research priorities. And then the third on this list is suicide risk and prevention from Dave Gunnell and colleagues in Bristol and in Manchester saying that we might need a public health response as well as targeting vulnerable people. Some of the interventions should be there for everyone. And then there's the psychiatric and neuropsychiatric 
issues which I'll come on to. So what do we know about the mental health effects of social isolation? Well, loneliness is likely to be increased and uh, work here at UCL is shown that loneliness and mental health problems are very closely linked. Alcohol is an interesting one because we know that overall alcohol consumption has reduced during the lockdown. Of course, there's no pubs to go to, but it's very likely that there's been an increase in solitary and problem drinking. And I think we're going to see the effects of those before long. Access to services. Well, because the NHS has been trying to protect itself against being overwhelmed, a lot of people have been suffering in silence. Uh, with mental health problems, but I think they're coming to the fore now. And then we have all the social disruption of lack of work and lack of exercise, which we know normally are a positive benefit to health. And we've seen increases in things like domestic violence uh, on, the, on the negative side. So those are all just to do with our attempts to deal with the pandemic. Now, here's the first systematic review of the psychiatric and neuropsychiatric presentations associated with coronavirus infections, which was published this very day in Lancet Psychiatry. Some brilliant work from Jonathan Rogers, a PhD student in psychiatry in Chesney, uh, a, a researcher from King's and others from the team. So what have we shown? This was a review of 72 studies covering 10 countries. Mostly the coronavirus infections we're talking about are from the SARS epidemic in 2003-04. Uh, some are from the MERS, that's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome from 2012. And then 12 studies are from the current pandemic. Some of them not even fully published yet. So dealing with uh, several thousand cases and controls. Some of the follow-up studies are quite long from the, the, the SARS years, and we can really get a window in the future from those. So what did Jonathan Rogers find? First of all, looking at acute illness in people hospitalized for coronavirus infections of all sorts, there's a lot of um, depression and anxiety confusion and impaired memory, suggesting some disruption in cognition, as well as insomnia. Psychosis, that's hallucination delusions, rarely occurred and usually they were linked to treatment. So quite high rates of anxiety and depression in people who are quite ill. So I can, I've done this graph to show that these are the high levels of symptoms in the acute phase of coronavirus infections. I suppose it's the good news is that when the person recovers from the illness, these symptoms tend to subside. In the post illness phase, we're down to pretty much baseline levels for depression and anxiety. What about emergence of new psychiatric disorders? Well, as you can see from this slide, top of the league is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder out a third of people following coronavirus. So in depression and anxiety, we have rates of around 15% in people who've recovered from coronavirus. And bearing in mind that about one in six people of the population at any time suffers from mental health problems. But higher rates in uh, of PTSD, and this is all following the SARS epidemic in, in Asia, and you can see there's quite a lot of variability, but it comes out on average, 33% suffered from some kind of stress disorder. And that was sometimes many, many months, three years after they've recovered from the virus. So that's quite a concerning factor. So in our review, just concentrating on COVID-19, as I've said, in depression, as would be expected, but tends to be short-lived. Perhaps higher rates of confusion and agitation than other coronaviruses, but we should say that a lot of these studies were churned out very quickly. They weren't very high quality with not very good control groups, and we're now seeing reports of brain-based presentations, inflammation of the brain, 
perhaps due to the inflammatory response. And we'll learn more about those neurological and neuropsychiatric presentations, I'm sure, in the months to come. So Jonathan Rogers and colleagues concluded that most people would be expected to recover without suffering from a mental illness from the current pandemic. But there may be more cases of delirium or confusion, which could have some implications for the brain. It may be that it's just to do with not enough oxygen getting to the brain or the fever, but we'll have to keep a close eye on that. However, the lessons from these recent pandemics is that psychiatric problems, anxiety and depression and stress conditions may well be a feature going forward. And now is our chance to try and mitigate against these and think of the best kind of interventions. Now, it wasn't all negative. In the review, what came out was a phenomenon of post-traumatic growth. So for many people, they found that they've been never been as useful and as uh, vital as they were going through time. And that's a real defense against depression. So if, if there's a positive side to going through this pandemic, uh, we should really clutch onto that and build upon it. In terms of hot off the press studies from COVID-19, here's one from, from uh, China. And I've colored in blue scores on a depression scale and in red scores on a anxiety scale. And you can see that um, in this study, people with uh, COVID-19 had more anxiety, depression, even compared to people admitted to the same hospital with other kinds of pneumonia. should say, though, that the cutoff on these scales of eight was for the, min the most minor level of depression and anxiety, of possible depression and anxiety. So the actual levels of distress in amongst all the physical symptoms is not that high. So switching from clinical studies, what else is going on out there? Now this is Google searches uh, over the last few months. And that, so let me talk you through the graph. In green are searches for information about anxiety. Um, this is since January. Uh, the point A is where the first death fatality from COVID was reported. And the time point B is when the WHO announced that it was a pandemic. Uh, you can see that anxiety levels have been high and up and down, better at the weekends than during the week. The red is suicidal thoughts or inquiries on Google. And you can see this has also been quite high. You see that there's a, a jump there and that coincides with the sad uh, suicide of Caroline Flack that was reported, sometimes not very sympathetically in the media. It falls and then jumps up again. And this coincides with our lockdown and the global pandemic. So people are worried about self-harm and they're turning to Google for advice, hopefully safe advice. Another source of very uh, important information that completes the picture of the evidence I was talking about, which is people admitted to hospital. This is an ongoing self-report survey that uh, Daisy Fancourt and her colleagues have been doing now with over 100,000 participants at any one time. Uh, it's a snapshot of uh, the UK, people mostly middle-aged, mostly women, mostly not living alone. Uh, not the poorest, sort of, including some poor families as well as middle class, and quite a, a good rep representation from the point of view of reality of people with mental health conditions, nearly 18%, and most people living in towns or cities. So here's one of uh, the, the graphs from Daisy's study, which are published week by week. And as you can see, around the lockdown, we were all at the peak in terms of anxiety and depression. And since then, anxiety levels amongst the public 
have tended to fall. Depression also, but somewhat more slowly. Perhaps we're getting used to this new normal. And again, the absolute levels of anxiety and depression are well below the sort of clinical cutoffs, which would be 10 on this scale. And then breaking it down, you can see that young people, this is uh, thoughts of self-harm. Young people uh, have this much worse than older people, and it's not really abating. And if you look at the graph in the bottom right-hand corner, this is thoughts of self-harm. In orange is the men, people with a mental health diagnosis, and in blue is the rest. And you can see that these levels are really quite high. They go up and down. But that's obviously a measure of people who are already perhaps vulnerable, really struggling with their mental health at this time. Coming towards the end now, what else do we know from anecdotes and other reports in the media? Well, we think that self-harm presentations to accident and emergency departments have come down, but that's because no one's really going to A&E but it's probably going on behind closed doors. I've spoken about alcohol and drug misuse. Uh, it's a mixed picture, but a lot of problems perhaps behind closed doors. We can expect that health anxiety and OCD type symptoms are gonna increase. People who already are worried about germs uh, are gonna find this a very difficult time. And we might see people with the more severe kinds of mental illnesses uh, finding themselves uh, having major problems and decompensating. We're all a bit paranoid at this time of year. I would say though, my predictions are that the, the anxiety and depressed mood that we are seeing in the population down as has been shown in these other surveys, um, Mental health outcomes are perhaps going to be more related to how we get out of the pandemic, to how the economy uh, recovers. We will see some new syndromes post-COVID. Some of these will be due to the infection of the brain, and, but we should remember that biological, psychological and social factors always pertain in any mental health condition. And we should be very concerned about stress disorders, particularly those who find themselves in the front line. So let me summarize uh, the lecture today. Don't let anyone tell you that the pandemic is unprecedented because there's nothing unprecedented in the world. It's always been there before. And we should at least strive to learn lessons from previous pandemics mental health, on physical health, and the way we want our society to be. Modern communications and social media have really helped us keep track on how people are feeling, whether it's through uh, Google, whether it's through apps and online uh, surveys. Interestingly, before the pandemic started, we were blaming social media for the worst effects on mental health, and now it's a lifeline. I think anxiety and depression have emerged as natural reactions to illness and more serious mental disorders and even suicide may be at risk of increasing. We, but most people are resilient and at least we've got the warning. And I know a lot of organizations, charities and uh, mental health teams are reaching out to people to try and help them in this very difficult time. Post-traumatic stress disorder does seem to have been a feature of recent pandemics and may well be one for the current one. And it, I think, is in part related to the fact that we are questioning everything. We want to know what's going on. And sometimes we feel that others are to blame for how things have turned out. And it's those combinations that I think leads people to have longer term reactions to this condition. So I hope that's been a reasonable tour of mental health effects of this pandemic. I'll give the last word to Albert Camus. Don't necessarily fo follow him in terms of his general healthy appearance, but he does make this important 
conclusion that we're going to make mistakes. Uh, we're not saints, but at least we can try and do better, help each other, and as professionals to try our utmost to be healers. Thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, uh, Tony, for such a fantastic presentation. It was brilliant to hear um, both about the context that we can learn from from previous pandemics, but also about the data that are starting to come out um, from studies around the world on, on COVID. And uh, we've got a whole number of questions that have come in. Um, so we'd love to put some of these to you. And one of the questions that's come up that's been voted up by several people is this issue about the media. So we've had a question saying, how much do you think the mental health problems that we're now seeing as a result actually of the pandemic versus as a result of the media hype, which is being particularly promoted around the pandemic? Well, I think uh, talking in terms of media hype is a little bit dangerous. Uh, I think there's been some genuine concerns and, and clinicians uh, are seeing very difficult cases, but it's very difficult for an individual to really appreciate what's going on in the whole country and in different contexts. And that's why we really need research to help us. Um, there was a comment yesterday uh, talking about a tsunami of mental health problems. Um, it's just a metaphor, but I, I, my metaphor is slightly different. I think it's more like the sea level is rising and people who've never known the water to be lapping at their feet, are feeling it for the first time. But there are people who are, as it were, living in low-lying areas, people who have always struggled with their mental health, and they are finding themselves up to their waists and beyond. So I think it's a gradual effect uh, that is affecting us all. Uh, mostly we'll be okay, but we've got to look after others who are a bit more vulnerable. Thank you. And uh, we're just keeping on that theme of the media. Do you think that people's anxieties, for example, at the moment, are being exacerbated by the media portrayal of coronavirus. In other words, the, the obvious need of the media to keep producing headlines, and particularly the focus on a lot of these headlines, most of them being negative, which is, of course, understandable by, right now, but is that feeding into people's anxieties and actually worsening mental health? Well, it is that is possible. I think in times of uncertainty, we all we all hate uncertainty. Uh, it makes us comfortable and anxious. Um, and I think uh, that's bound to happen until we know more about uh, what's going to happen to people who get this condition. Is there going to be a cure? Is there going to be a vaccine? Um, I I haven't really felt that most of the media have been uh, unreasonable. I think there's a lot of stories about how people have coped amazingly well, about how communities have come together. So I think we've got to balance some of the natural fear and anxiety with some of these stories about how we can uh, rise to the occasion. So that we've, we've got the media to thank for both of those kinds of stories. That's a lovely perspective on it. Um, we've had a question that's come through from Emerson Sutton, who is um, a 13 years old and uh, goes to Trinity Secondary School Lee. And the question is um, that uh, Emerson's getting involved as being a mental health and wellbeing ambassador at school uh, on return and wants to know how to prioritize and ensure that classmates get the best support and guidance. And I wondered if you have any thoughts on that. Well, you know, that's great work, Emma. And, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're to be commended for uh, putting yourself out there. I think if the adult world is anything to do with younger people, which I'm sure it is, we do find that support from each other is the best kind of support. We don't necessarily need therapists, psychologists, or teachers even, uh, telling us what to do, but we do need to be able to share with each other our stories, share what has helped us 
and what hasn't helped. And that in itself is, is a, a tremendous way of uh, staving off more and more problems. So, you know, I hope that's something that you might be able to coordinate with your classmates. And uh, I think you'll be doing a great job. Thanks, Penny. Um, we've got lots more questions coming in at the moment. One of them is about the government. Um, asking what you think the government has considered previous pandemics and uh, been considering the previous evidence on mental health and giving recommendations and, and uh, actions that's been based on that. And if, if, if not, do you feel there are particular recommendations that might have been missed or that should be acted on? Well, I think the the government is getting a lot of advice from from scientists and in a way everyone's a critic uh we're all perhaps uh too 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 free and too easy with with our advice uh i think this is a brand new condition uh so there will be things that we're learning as we go along uh but it would be foolish not to learn the lesson of the previous pandemic. I think as a country, we're a little bit unprepared because the SARS epidemic didn't really reach us and nor did the MERS. And of course, the Spanish flu is outside our living memory. Um, so I think uh, it's possible that we weren't really ready for the adjustments that were necessary, whereas people in China and Asia were, were, were quicker off the mark. Um, I would also say that one of the pandemics, but from conflict in war zones, for example, uh, again, where post-traumatic stress conditions have been studied, it seems that despite the extremes of trauma that people are under, what determines whether they have longer term difficulties is what happens in the aftermath and sometimes uh, we've learned the lesson that too vigorous uh, therapy can actually have a bad effect and again as we were saying it's it's the ability of people to support themselves to find the time but also to feel that their work is being appreciated and the clapping for the NHS is part of that being appreciated as well as them getting the protection they need, uh, the sleep they need, and that applies to all of the workers that are venturing out now. I think a, a lesson from the past is that we've got to value people and support them and not necessarily medicalize them if we're gonna get through this. Getting through this obviously brings us to the issue about future pandemics as well. You mentioned that we weren't able to be as prepared as other countries because partly because we just haven't gone through these kinds of experiences as much in the last couple of decades. But looking ahead, it is likely that something like this will happen again. What do you think are the most important things to have in mind when we're preparing for future pandemics in relation to mental health? Oh gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> it is. Um, it's voted by many people. Really an expert. <laughs> I, I I think, and this is kind of more of a personal view, that um, it's a, a, a crisis like this is how well you're doing anyway. If you think about a relationship, if you've got a strong relationship and then something goes wrong, uh, it will show up the cracks in that relationship. But if things, if you're basically good, if you're basically strong, you'll get over it. I think what we've seen over recent years is reductions in our health service, in a denigration of the social care system. Um, and that's left us in a weak position to deal with the crisis. We have been talking more about mental health over the last few years which I think that's been generally very positive. But as I say, uh, we perhaps have to move from awareness into action uh, and building up our resilience for future pandemics will be part of our reaction to the current pandemic. 
there's been a nice positive question that's come in as well, um, which is around what we might all individually learn from this. Do you think that as well as just getting through this, and you spoke about some people who are in a strong position being able to get through this, might this actually help to make people more resilient and open to change and have other positive effects for people moving forwards? I think so, and I hope so. I think when people do come through this, they do feel that there are some positives. On the other hand, we've got to be careful. The word, the word resilience is sometimes overused, and some people get the message that they're being told to pull themselves together, be resilient. Uh, I think we all know that that doesn't really help, and that isn't very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, do, I think it does help us appreciate how we depend on each other, how much we value our social interactions. And in fact, you, Daisy, this is your area of church, how, how culture and social uh, interactions are so beneficial to mental health. So hopefully uh, we can find ways of uh, restoring these very quickly as we come out of the, the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm personally looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to drinking coffee again uh, outside. Uh, I'm looking forward to playing and watching football again, um, although that has mixed effects on my mental health. <laughs> uh, now, one of the themes that I think we're going to start hearing more and more about is inequalities in relation to this pandemic. We've had this uh, myth that we're all in this together, but actually obviously gradually starting to be eroded as a concept and we've got a question that's come through about um the inequalities we're already seeing in cases and deaths amongst people from BAME communities and um, uh, the question is might we start to see different mental health problems for BAME groups post-COVID well that's a very important area and again it's something that we we need more research to understand it uh, there are already great inequalities in terms of uh, mental health, mental illness, um, and it di disproportionately affects people of different uh, uh, minority ethnic backgrounds. So again, we, we, we're starting from a, a, a base where we know these things are important. Um, I think it, my reading of uh, the current pandemic is that um, this might account for excesses of infections and deaths in people from BAME communities, but there's probably some biological differences going on there too. Uh, I think some people from ethnic minority groups that I know don't necessarily like being lumped all together. And, you know, people from the Caribbean or Africa or the Philippines don't necessarily have much in common. And maybe it's to do with darker skin and vitamin D, rather uh, minute and biochemical as that, as it is to do with uh, opportunities and social supports. I think when we look at, say, doctors, uh, a, a kind of minority group, usually a quite a privileged minority group, we find that even within that group, there are more people, more very sad fatalities. Uh, from COVID-19. And I think these are people who all have good jobs, have been to university. So we should be open to biological as well as psychological and social factors being important here because they'll each need uh, a different uh, approach to treatment. Thank you. Now we're drawing to the end of our time, but we have just got uh, one question I think would be quite a good one to end on, which is around the long lasting impact of this pandemic. Now, of course, there are many people now who'll be experiencing symptoms of anxiety, depression, stress, that might feel at odds to their normal mental health status. And there's been a question around whether these effects are likely to be long lasting. Should people be worried if they're having these feelings and might they expect to recover or is there a risk these are going to go on for a long time and become a, a sort of a more long-term problem for them? Well, I'd be the last person to want to give advice to um, many, many people um, who I don't know and I don't know their circumstances. I can feel for, for those out there who are finding it difficult. Uh, your surveys show that 
depression, anxiety are beginning to fall in general. So perhaps uh, our natural recovery systems are kicking in. I would hope so. Uh, I think the other things that we've lost because of lockdown that are probably having a bad effect on our health, we can do something about. We know that exercise is great for mental health. Um, we know that routine is very important, good sleep uh, and so forth. So there are simple things that perhaps can keep us uh, on an even keel. But I'd like to see the health service, the non-COVID parts of the health service get back up and running again. And I know my colleagues are desperate for that to happen so that those people who really do need a little bit more, be it medication, therapy, or just reassurance that they can get the help uh, that they need at this difficult time. Thank you so much, Tony. This has been the most fantastic seminar. Uh, really great to hear that we're sourcing precedent experience for so many people. There is so much that we can learn from looking back historically at previous pandemics to contextualize what everyone's going through at the moment. So thank you so much again for your talk. Uh, the next lecture will be on Thursday, and if people are interested in attending, they can check the UCL Minds calendar for this and for other upcoming events. Thank you very much for joining us.